Einen schönen guten Abend und herzlich willkommen hier im Kino des Deutschen Filmmuseums zu unserer Reihe Lecture in Film, die Sie natürlich kennen. Das ist heute jetzt, ja, glaube ich, schon die zehnte Veranstaltung, neunte oder zehnte in dieser Reihe. Seit Oktober zeigen wir hier Lubitsch-Filme und freuen uns sehr, dass Referenten aus der gesamten Welt hierher kommen. Heute ist das Eva Matzierska. Wir freuen uns sehr. Sie wird auf Englisch nachher sprechen. Marc Siegel wird sie gleich vorstellen. Das ist ganz toll. Und ja, dass diese Reihe möglich ist, auch das muss immer wieder gesagt werden, weil es so toll ist, ähm, ist zu verdanken der Universität, der Goethe-Universität, vor allen Dingen dem Institut für Theater, Film und Medien. Wissenschaften, Rembert Hüser und Marc Siegel haben die Reihe organisiert und das Exzellenzcluster Normative Orders ähm, macht es möglich, dass Sie hier mit freiem Eintritt diese Vorträge und die Filme sich anschauen können. Also das auch nochmal vielen, vielen Dank dafür, ähm, dass das möglich ist. Die Hessische Film- und Medienakademie ist auch involviert. So viel der Vorrede. Wir haben jetzt wie immer unser Thema Schnell wieder Witz, die Filme von Ernst Lubitsch. Heute geht es ins Jahr 1918, wie Sie schon sehen können, kamen. Es wird ein bisschen musikalischer, wenn wir auch nachher eine Stummfilmbegleitung haben. Das Ganze schön von einer 35mm Kopie. Das wollen wir uns natürlich nicht entgehen lassen. Wir machen auch wie immer ein Begleitprogramm mit äh, ganz netten Kopien, wie ich finde. Jetzt zum Beispiel am Samstag können Sie noch um 18 Uhr einen der großen Klassiker von Lubitsch sehen. Design for Living, Serenade zu dritt mit Frederick March, Gary Cooper und Miriam Hopkins. Grandiose Zusammenstellung, einer meiner Lieblingsfilme von Lubitsch. Und dann auch noch in der nächsten Woche Clooney Brown. Mittwoch, und, äh, Mittwoch, 24. Mittwoch, 31. jeweils 18 Uhr. All das sind Filme, die man sonst selten zu sehen bekommt, die in dieser Reihe leider nicht von einem Referenten ausgewählt worden sind. Deswegen haben wir gesagt, wir müssen die Ihnen natürlich noch zeigen. So, aber das nur vorweg. Ähm, das ist unser Rahmenprogramm. Das wirkliche Highlight sind die Vorträge. Sie können danach immer diskutieren. Und an dieser Stelle wünsche ich viel Spaß und übergebe das Wort an Marc Siegel. Schönen Abend. Um, ja, und wir um, bedanken uns beim Filmmuseum, dass wir diese Reihen immer machen dürfen. Um, das freut uns natürlich sehr, dass wir nicht nur über Film und Medien uh, referieren an der Uni, aber dass wir auch um, so einen öffentlichen Austausch haben und auch die Filme in so einem wunderbaren roten, orangen Umwelt anschauen dürfen. Um, ich wechsle jetzt ins Englische. I'm very happy to be back here in front of you all at one of our Lubitsch lecture and film events, um, particularly this evening. Eva Majerska is a leading scholar in matters of European, Polish, Slovak, Czech, British, and European cinemas. No, that wasn't the sentence. I'll start again. Maybe vielleicht sind sind Sie nicht so froh, mich wieder vor Ihnen zu haben. Aber naja, so ist es. Es ist unsere Reihe. Eva Majerska is a leading scholar in matters of European and national cinemas. Having published books on Polish, Czech, Slovak, British, and European cinemas. Her books on women in Polish cinema from 2006 and masculinities in Polish, Czech, and Slovak cinema from 2008 have been particularly useful for my own teaching in those areas, as my students could attest. In addition to dealing with gender, her works on film address such issues as the representation of travel, the city, and issues of cultural and political history. She has also published books in both English and Polish on individual filmmakers, including Jerzy Skolomowski, Roman Polanski, Nani Moretti, and Wong Kar Wai. Altogether, she has published over 20 monographs and edited collections. Her most recent work has shifted slightly from film to address issues in studies of popular music. In 2013, for instance, she published a book with a great title and an even greater subtitle, Falco and Beyond, Neo-Nothing Post of All. And she's currently involved in a project researching electronic music in Austria. An eclectic, as you can tell, and wide-ranging scholar, Eva Majerska was trained in film and philosophy in Poland, where she worked as a film critic before moving to Britain over 20 years ago. Currently, she's a professor of contemporary cinema at the University of Central Lancashire. 
And I first met Eva at the fantastic New Horizons Film Festival in Wroclaw a number of years ago, and we bonded over the great Serbian director Dusan Makaveyev, who was a guest of the festival. On a lovely summer night on the central square, the festival screened the 1918 German silent film Mania, the history of a cigarette factory worker, starring Pola Negri. Perhaps for this reason, I connect Eva and Pola to this day. And when Rembert and I were planning the series, I thought it would be fantastic to have her perspective on Pola Negri's collaboration with Ernst Lubitsch. She fortunately immediately agreed, actually indicating that she had been planning for some time to do a project on Polish female uh, performers who have performed internationally with other directors. So I um, am thrilled that she will be perhaps giving us the, the beginnings of this project in the form of her lecture today, which has a slightly different title than the one in the program. And you could read it up there. Please join me in welcoming Eva Majerska. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really touched and honored to be here, uh, despite the fact that I cannot describe myself as a Lubitsch scholar. Uh, but uh, as you noticed, I sort of do various things. And this is maybe the reason that I um, give um, that I give this um, gave this uh, lecture this title in mirrors. Uh, uh, try to look at um, uh, Carmen from different perspectives. This is Lubitsch, probably you are by now familiar with his uh, appearance with Pola Negri. So I will, would like to look a bit uh, at Carmen as a cultural text, uh, at Lubitsch's career in the early, actually post uh, First World period, but also uh, uh, look at what he was do doing actually to this point, and finally, uh, at uh, Pola Negri in this film and the wider context of her career and careers of Polish actresses uh, in foreign films. Um, probably you are familiar with, uh, with the story of Carmen, because Carmen is one of the most iconic cultural texts, at least as far as European culture is concerned. Um, and uh, um, uh, the, the novella, uh, which uh, was written by Prosper Merime, is a reflection of Hispanophilia and Orientalism characteristic to 19th century France. During this period, uh, during this period many people traveled to, um, to Spain, which at the time was regarded as kind of uh, um, exotic for uh, for these travelers. Um, and uh, uh, Mary May was among them. He himself traveled to Spain uh, in uh, 1830 and uh, then wrote about Carmen. And this is actually not the best known uh, story of Carmen. Uh, the better known version is uh, opera uh, by Georges George Bizet, uh, which premiered in Paris in 1875. Uh, this again became one of the most popular operas globally. And I think the music from, uh, from uh, Bizet's Carmen is actually known by people who have no interest or knowledge of uh, opera or so serious music. But what is interesting is that uh, Bizet didn't experience the, the success of his work. He died after uh, its 33rd performance. Uh, and so, uh, and by this, by this time, it wasn't so appreciated. Um, most, uh, 
Carmen ad adaptations uh, claim that they film the novella, although they are rather adaptations of, uh, of Bizet's opera. And the most likely reason are copyright issues, uh, namely the fact that uh, the opera was protected by copyright un until 1981. And here it is worth mentioning that uh, mm, from this perspective, um, Carmen, uh, Lubitsch Car Carmen's indeed uh, can be regarded as an adaptation of the original text rather than uh, Bizet's uh, adaptation. Um, just briefly, what is the narrative? If, even if you know it, I think it's 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 worth looking at it to um, uh, to notice certain you know characteristic. Uh, characteristics which which pertain to this uh, um, to this uh, wave of interest in uh, exotic places and also to um, um, to the cinema of this period. So the story is a tale within a tale. Its male protagonist Don Jose. Sorry that I didn't put here uh, um, um, accent. It's usually due to my laziness, uh, uh, leaves the Basque country and joins the army. Uh, and then he meets Carmen. Uh, he is asked to arrest her. And uh, he uh, falls under, this, under her spell. He meets her, joins her, uh, and her... Uh, uh, Highway, highwaymen friends, uh, and the tragedy unfolds. Um, so, on the whole, it's a it's a tragic story of uh, of a man who falls under the spell of a, we can describe as a femme fatale, and the price which he has to pay uh, for this infatuations. Uh, Bizet, Bizet's version simplifies the narrative. It uh, 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 gets rid, rid of, this, uh, of these brackets. So this is just the story rather than story as told from the distance. Um, so I would say that we can reduce it to certain uh, aspects. And these aspects will be also um, found in quite a lot of films made uh, in Europe around this period. So um, one is a corruption of a good man by a cunning woman. There is a, a description of what can be described, what, what, what can be labeled as a, as a low life, a life of a, of a criminal. Uh, then is the sexual desire which is punished by death, and there is this aspect of exoticism. And uh, actually, the mixture of these uh, elements were the reason that uh, uh, initially uh, uh, Bizet's work was uh, pronounce as somehow um, unsuitable for the audiences. It put the, the bourgeois audiences off because it was regarded as, you know, scandalous. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, in the longer term, these elements ensured the, the story's popularity and longevity, because basically these are the elements of, uh, of a perfect melodrama. Um, and this is also proved by numerous screen adaptations of Bizet's work. At the same time, the reason that there were so many um, adaptations, I would say, are probably due to the fact that this is a male melodrama. Although the story has Carmen in its title, this is really the story of a man who suffers. So it's somehow different than in majority of melodramas which center of, of a female suffering. Um, uh, so such male melodramas are not un uncommon in European interwar cinema. Still, they were rather in the, in the minority. Uh, in German cinema, maybe this was a different case. Certainly after the war, it was a different case because uh, Rainer Werner Fassbinder made so many melodramas about, you know, about male suffering. Uh, 
Um, in Poland, actually, we also have a number of uh, uh, male melodramas in this period, and usually there will be also uh, around the same scheme. A man from a higher class meets a woman from a lower class. She's sometimes uh, also uh, exoticized. Uh, she doesn't need to be foreign, but for example, she can she can come from the mountains and she falls under under her spell, and this causes uh, this drama. Either she kills somebody or she, he's, he's killed by somebody. Um, so this is we can say somehow you know a, a misogynistic uh, uh, narrative as. The point is that the, there is this ma bad woman who inf infects man literally or metaf metaphorically, we can say with sexually transmitted disease. So the, the, the moral of the story is somehow stay away from, from, from these women, from these exotic women, because uh, they um, bring bad luck. Um, so I would say that despite this, uh, this uh, focus on a, on a bad woman, uh, these stories actually uh, somehow reflect on I would, uh, what I would describe as a feudal capitalism, uh, namely a uh, lack of opportunities for social promotion, promotion for women of these lower classes. So practically the only way for them to climb the social ladder is through crime or aligning themselves to a rich man or both. So, so in this sense, Carmen is a, is a perfect uh, um, reflection on this position. Um, uh, Carmen, as, as I already mentioned, was a, was a product of, um, of Mary May's travel to, um, uh, to uh, Spain, which at the time uh, uh, was seen not only as a geographical, but as a cultural periphery of Europe. Uh, and uh, as such, also it... Uh, it fulfilled the role of uh, ersatz tourism uh, because it sort of is based on this uh, concept that uh, people who live in foreign places are very different from us. So the the, the premise is to somehow exoticize the others, play up the difference, and this is this is the case in uh, in the novella and in Bizet's novel. Carmen is presented as a very different uh, uh, woman, very different character from the from from the man. Um, but at the same time, um, uh, she is presented already according to certain existing stere stereotypes. By the time uh, um, uh, Mary May wrote, uh, wrote Carmen, they were already very strongly um, uh, very strong stereotypes about gypsies. There were a lot of gypsies in uh, in Europe, and this stereotype of gypsy of a gypsy woman uh, uh, existed. So, so gypsy women were uh, um, viewed as being very, you know, sensual, sexual, as well as being good in dancing. So the the character was expected to somehow convey it. And I would say this is the reason that uh, uh, for um, Carmen's, if, uh, if, uh, not real gypsies were uh, uh, sought, but uh, uh, usually women who were somehow uh, uh, foreign uh, in relation to the country of production, so they could be seen as others, but also not gypsy not gypsies, not real gypsies. They were usually regarded as those who would be better in, um, in conveying this otherness. They will, be, they will know how to, how to present it. Um, and other examples of, of that were Dolores Del Rio, who played Carmen in, in um, Walsh films, and also Maruszka Detmers, who played in Carmen by... Um, by uh, Godard, so they were never, never Spanish, never gypsies. This is also true about Paula Negri, obviously, who was Polish. Um, so I would say that 
such casting is not meant to portray exotic countries realistically, but they are imagined by tourists. Tourists, and this is actually at the at the core of uh, exotic and uh, oriental representation. Edward Said, in his famous book about orientalism, wrote that orientalism is not about presenting Orient realistically or from the perspective who live in these oriental cu cultures and places, but how they are. Uh, uh, how the Westerners want to present them. So such te texts are always somehow created from the position of, we can say, of, of, uh, of cultural dominance. And this is, this is, this is a case here. Um, so um, so this, is, this is one aspect of, of, of Carmen. So this, the second question is uh, uh, how it how obviously Carmen, which we talk about, is not a, is not a book, is a film. Um, so how it fits within the, within the uh, production context of German cinema at the time and then, and then Lubitsch, Lubitsch's career. Uh, as you probably know, Germany was a country which was suffering greatly during the First World War. And after um, and after uh, after it ended, this was a time of um, even of hunger and of political chaos. Uh, so the question is, you know, why such films were made? But the rule is that uh, somehow f cinema in many countries are flourishing in bad times, and this was also the case of um, of, of Germany, especially after uh, 1917 when Ufa was set up. So this um, this created uh, um, actually opportunity for great expansion of German cinema, um, and. Uh, uh, um, there were additional reasons that cinema was flourishing. Um, cost of labor was, short, was, was low. Uh, low. Uh, so films could be made cheaply due to a low cost of labor and sold abroad at profit, uh, which uh, allowed for investments. Even claimed that German cinema around this period was actually um, a uh, competitor of, uh, of Hollywood cinema. And one reason that Hollywood uh, looked for bringing talent from Europe was not only to sort of strengthen Hollywood cinema, but actually kill this competition. So, so uh, 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 Lubitsch's eventually relocation from Germany to Hollywood can be looked in this context of, 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 of uh, somehow weakening the weakening German cinema, which was, which was strong at the period. Uh, I just added here the, the comparison with Poland. Poland was also a very, very weak country after the, after the uh, uh, First, war, uh, First uh, World War, but cinema again was comparatively uh, um, successful industry. And this was partly because uh, it was one of the cheapest for forms of entertainment. So that when people had no money to, um, to um, heat their houses, for example, they used to go to the cinema because it was, uh, it was cheaper than, uh, um, than, than heat their houses. Um, uh, and now, uh, uh, how this film fits into Lubitsch's career. Uh, I don't know how much was told about Lubitsch in, um, in the previous lectures, uh, and I don't want to somehow bore you with the, with the history of, of Lubitsch's lives in career, but uh, just briefly, um, Lubitsch uh, uh, came from a family of Ashkenazi Jews. His father uh, was born in Grodno, uh, which uh, belonged to... Um, to, to, to Russian Empire and then moved to, to Berlin, where he uh, married uh, and uh, set up a tailoring business in Berlin. And uh, this business was um, uh, successful. Uh, he was able, at the peak of his uh, career, uh, to employ uh, 
eight people and also some other people who worked for him at home. So in his in his workshop, he had eight um, workers, and. Uh, uh, um, and hope that this will be also a career for his younger son. Um, there were four children in this household, so Ernst was the youngest. He also had an older brother and two, uh, two older sisters. He was actually there was a, there was a gap in uh, between children. The three were close to each other, and he was he was the youngest, and apparently he was the favorite son of his father. And uh, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately for for for, for uh, Lubitsch, uh, he wasn't particularly keen to work in 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 this business. He was sent to uh, work for another company, but then he was kind of sacked or left, and he returned to his. Uh, to his home to work, but during this period he started to um, take um, acting classes, and um, uh, these um, acting uh, classes and skills he developed uh, took him to um, to um, to the theater of Max Reinhardt who was at the time regarded as the greatest uh, theater director in Germany and perhaps uh, in the whole of Europe. Uh, he worked with um, Reinhardt for six years, but never really built up a solid career as, a, as an actor. He was mainly employed in uh, small roles. Um, perhaps this had something to do with his um, physical appearance. He was a rather short man and apparently not very handsome. So it's difficult to assess now looking at his pictures. I thought he looked quite good for me. But uh, <laughs> but he was regarded as not, not very attractive. So he was somehow condemned to this, what we can describe as, as characteristic roles. But they were even not the main characteristic roles. They were somehow near, you know, the bottom of the, of the, of the casting. Uh, uh, list, which uh, which um, made made him frustrated apparently. So um, when the when the cinema started to develop in um, in Berlin, this um, this he saw as a sort of opportunity to try in something better, also as a way to earn more money, because by the time when war broke out uh, in uh, Berlin. Uh, the situation of his family s s worsened significantly. There was no um, no cloth to buy to make clothes. There were no people willing to buy clothes. So at some stage, he became the main supporter of his family. So he actually had to work a lot to uh, to uh, to support his father, his mother, his siblings, and then even the the, the spouses of the siblings. And according to his biographers, he sometimes worked like almost round the clock. So he worked in, in cabaret, in theater, and also in the cinema. Sometimes during the one day, he had all these assignments. Uh, and cinema gradually became the main, uh, um, his main interest, first his main source of income, and then, then the main uh, interest. Um, partly because it paid better than uh, than uh, theater, and partly because he somehow discovered that there was more scope for experimentation and so on. So he he first was um, uh, acting again in small roles, although in cinema he managed to somehow create a more distinct persona, and this persona is sometimes um, described and actually condemned as a, as a sort of anti-Semitic representation of, of, of a Jew. He played often these sort of Jews who, who were um, uh, um, somehow cunning, uh, lecherous, and, and, and so on. Apparently, when, um, when Nazis came into power, they really 
uh, like these films because they somehow demonstrated that they somehow representation of Jews that wasn't really uh, in conflict with them with the way w Jews somehow saw themselves. So L Lubitsch somehow proved that. Um, uh, for me, it's it's not really the case of that. I think for me, it's it's more more the um, uh, the sign that Lubitsch was always somehow um, uh, very sensitive to stereotypes. He wasn't a director who will somehow you know break stereotypes. He was more somebody who will somehow play with stereotypes, try to fill these sort of forms with something more important. I think this this somehow for me proves that he was a like instinctive you know popular director. If you want to be a popular director, you just don't you know break uh, with uh, with the ideas which people have you change them slightly. So he was very sort of attuned to, to the way. And this also somehow links to links to Carmen. As I said, Carmen was already based on cultural stereotypes and actually most of films which which Lubitsch made in this period, but also later in his careers, they will be films which already somehow deal with certain known uh, um, accepted ideas. Um, so, so he started as an actor, and as as an, uh, thanks to that, he um, uh, got in contact with uh, with a number of later prominent actors uh, in uh, Reinhardt's theater and and in cinema, such as Jannings. But also, he met Paula Negri, and uh, they became close friends. Sort of. Uh, confirmed that uh, he was actually the only actress in his uh, in his career at the time and maybe generally uh, who was who was really his his friend there were there were there were close collaborators and he um, um, uh, appreciated her character and vice versa um, so that there was a sort of special, you know, rapport uh, between them, and uh, uh, this was probably based on uh, on two um, aspects. Uh, one was uh, they were both uh, in instinctively cosmopolitan. Um, Negri told about him, as I put here, any town with a population of less than a million was beneath his consideration. Uh, so he somehow fit very much again to, to this sort of concept of a, of a cosmopolitan Jew who's very, you know, urban and, and like to travel and feels at home in various, you know, cultures. Apparently, uh, uh, Berlin wasn't his favorite uh, place. He, his, uh, 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 he, his, his real love uh, in uh, during the time when he lived in Europe was was Budapest. He loved to go to Budapest and and enjoy life uh, there. And uh, he told many anecdotes about uh, about uh, um, um, Budapest. Uh, Okay, and so I argue that I would argue that cosmopolitanism is is reflected in his films, uh, which are typically based on well known stories, and are also set in different locations, but these locations are always somehow um, um, not real. We can say um, somebody coined the term that there's uh, there's Lubitsch land, so the 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 films can be placed here and there, but actually they are never really very realistic in their representation of locations. Um, and it's true, he's not a director who you know, pays much, much uh, uh, attention to represent realistically a specific you know, cultural milieu of, of physical place. Uh, and uh, also, spectacle always matters more than political ideology. It's very different, difficult to somehow say, you know, what are the values there. Uh, certainly, um, maybe the only value uh, 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 which we uh, 
uh, find in his films is somehow the acceptance of uh, you know of unconventional life of open sexuality and so on and somehow generally there is a lack of uh, of didacticism in his films if it, if it can be regarded as a as a, as a value um, so as as with other directors, as with other Jewish directors who um, made Korean abroad, I think perhaps here the, the good comparator will be Alexander Korda and Polish Michał Warszyński, is that these films were regarded as elegant. Uh, uh, and and these these directors somehow also were very very skillful in in playing with these uh, with these stereotypes and also showing to uh, to people from a specific culture how this culture looks like so they were somehow better than natives in imagining uh, uh, their own culture um, so. This was at the expense, if we can say, of a certain lack of realism. Um, these films also have have a, have a very often the idea of of of, of a climbing a, so, a social ladder. People there somehow want to be in a better place than they are. Um, and I would say these sort of films are, for me, touristy films. They do not show the lives of the higher classes from the inside or the, the, the lives of these sort of exotic people from the inside, but the, but the way the people of the lower classes or the, or the foreigners or the tourists imagine them. This can be regarded as a, as, a, as, a, as a weakness, or this can be regarded as a, as a strength. I think that the popular cinema is very often based on, on, on this assumption. And this we can see also in uh, Carmen. Um, in terms of, of the film structure, the film retain, retains the original flashback of tale within the tale structure. Um, in terms of, 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 of the style, um, it's, it's quite early films by, by Lubitsch. So, um, 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 so I would say this film somehow more um, uh, betrays the period rather than, you know, what, what will be Lubitsch's style or Lubitsch's touch. Um, uh, uh, can be regarded as, as a bit clumsy, actually, uh, about the same time when I watched this film on, on YouTube, I showed my students uh, Mitchell and Kenyon films, very early documentary films made in Britain, and I was somehow surprised how similar the films are in terms of, of cinematography. Uh, in both cases, we see a lot of people packed in, in front of the camera, uh, in... in uh, 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 in in case of uh, Carmen's film, sometimes we know that they are extras. They are somehow, you know, look like uh, wanting to be put on on the film. Um, the film is dynamic, which is a, which is a, which is great strength. Um, uh, but this dynamism is is largely due to editing. Um, Still, it's it's a well told story, despite the sort of dynamism and the fact that a lot of it's taken out from the original story in order to present it in in this length. Uh, the viewer is able to follow events. So this is this will be always the case with Lubitsch. The the films in, in he, he he was at this stage already a very good you know storyteller. We always know what is happening. It's not a film with, when when one is lost. Um, and the focus is on the spectacle rather than psychological subtlety. Although um, I would say maybe this is also partly because of uh, of limited uh, means which directors had the time at their disposal. Namely, there was no dialogue, so everything had to be presented by you know broad gestures and and uh, um, by by that rather than by words. Um, the film is very much regarded as a, as a vehicle for Paula Negri, so she's the main character in the film. Um, so so uh, she she plays obviously Carmen, Carmen here. Um, 
and already by this point, uh, uh, Negri was regarded as as an actress who. Um, uh, who, who was very suited to um, exotic roles. Uh, but this is, I would say, this was the sort of Eastern European exoticism. She plays, she plays somebody exotic by appropriating certain, you know, typical gestures. Um, but she's certainly more convincing than her partner here, played by Haru Litke, uh, as he is somehow um, wooden in the film. Uh, why he is uh, uh, somehow she plays with the whole of her body, and this will be also true about other uh, play, uh, other roles uh, uh, of Negri. Uh, so this is what the um, what uh, Lubitsch's uh, biographer wrote about her role. She's tigerishly sexy and believable, animated by never Hamish. She was already by this point regarded as this sort of volcano of sex. Um, a bit about Pola Negri. I already mentioned that she was uh, Polish. We don't know exactly when she was born. The, the, the dates uh, uh, different between what biographers claim with true dates of her birth and, and what she um, provided, but she was probably born in 1990. Uh, seven, so she was about five years younger than Carmen, and uh, uh, Negri came from from the same region as as I came from Kuyave, and uh, according to her uh, her own testimony, she came from a family of uh, of uh, impoverished uh, nobility, but I will. Disputed, probably she was just um, from much uh, lower background, and she moved to um, to uh, Warsaw with with her mother, and then tried in um, tried to make her in ballet, and then moved to cinema and she to theater and to cinema, and uh, she very quickly was sort of recognized as being very talented, which was the reason that she moved from, um, from uh, Warsaw to, um, to Berlin, where there were greater opportunities for her talent. Um, uh, and she then played with, uh, with a number of, um, of German films and became a um, favorite actress of... Um, of uh, Lubitsch. Um, and she was also the first, later, she was also the first European actress who was somehow lured by Hollywood and tried to make a career in Hollywood. And this is a sort of interesting um, story. Um, as on one hand, she, 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 made her, she made a career in the sense that she made a lot, lot of films. She played in many films, uh, usually this character of a, of a vamp, which she also mastered in, uh, in her European productions, including under, uh, under uh, Lubitsch. Um, and she somehow stood for this sort of broader pan-ethnic threat. So, she, so her roles were usually of this sort of exotic, dangerous woman. Uh, nevertheless, uh, she didn't match uh, her mentor and friend, Lubitsch. So she didn't make really great career in Hollywood and especially in the, uh, in the period of talkie, talkies. Uh, despite her high private profile. Uh, and according to Diane Negra, who wrote, uh, wrote a book about uh, um, non-American actresses in Hollywood cinema, uh, this was uh, due to her kind of ambivalent relationship which Hollywood had with continental gl glamour or her inability to somehow change to sort of suit to Hollywood. Uh, so Hollywood during this period somehow changed in the sense that it expected 
actresses to become kind of you know less some, somehow less glamorous more normal and this will be the case with many actresses who followed so um, Greta Garbo, Marlene Dietrich and Ingrid Bergman uh, they will somehow manage to balance the sort of stakes of exoticism and domest domesticity why in in the case of Neg Green, it never worked. She was somehow she somehow remained this sort of exotic actress, um, and she was also known for rather extravagant behavior. She had this uh, yes, she was walking this tiger on a leash, and uh, she had very uh, outrageous clothes. She also in influenced Hollywood by doing things which later were regarded as somehow normal. She was, she was regarded as the first actress who painted her toenails. This is sort of became normal practice, but at the times it was regarded as, as outrageous. So this was probably the reason that her, her career wasn't as spectacular as it, as it was uh, expected. Um, Nevertheless, she became one of the greatest uh, 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 stars of, 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 of the period. Maybe it's worth mentioning that she was one of the actresses who were, um, uh, who were approached to play the main role in, in Sunset Boulevard. And uh, she refused, as you probably are aware, this, this role was eventually... Um, uh, taken by uh, Gloria Swenson, who was regarded as her main competitor at, at this stage and sort of uh, was regarded as one of, of her best, one of the best of, of, of her career. So Negri didn't, didn't want to, to, to play such a role. Um, in a wider sense, I would say that Negri very well um, uh, represents the careers of Polish actresses and also Eastern European actresses who try to break to Hollywood. Uh, in Poland, we had cases of, of other actresses who also ended in Hollywood. They were never as successful as Negri. So in this sense, Pola Negri is the most popular Polish actresses of all times. But somehow she, she had the typical trajectory in the sense that her road to Hollywood was through Germany. So, so all these sort of Polish actresses who at least managed to make some career in Hollywood, they would always start in Poland, then go to Germany where they played in some films and then ended up in Hollywood. And this will be also, as I said, a case with some other Eastern European actresses. Okay, so this was that. Uh, I don't know if I went over time, under time no. or... Is it Fine. about the time? Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Ivan Majewska, for the great lecture. Thank you very okay, much. Thank you. Uwe Oberg, und Carmen. Dein Applaus. Ja, bevor ich unsere Referentin nach vorne bitte, natürlich noch mal äh, ganz kurz zwei, drei Fragen dazu. Du hast uns jetzt diesen 99 Jahre alten Film so lebendig näher gebracht. Mich würde interessieren, du hast ja jetzt quasi und, äh, diese spanische Welt, die uns Lubitsch präsentiert hat, auf eine vielleicht unerwartete Weise näher gebracht. Wie bereitest du dich vor und ist das dann auch Absicht, da vielleicht irgendwie einen Kontrapunkt zu setzen? Erzähl mal. Ja, also ich habe mir den Film, ich habe den Film nicht zum ersten Mal gemacht und äh, ich habe ihn mir gestern angeschaut und äh, ich habe ihn auf DVD zu Hause und sitze dann am Klavier und probiere verschiedene Stimmungen aus, die ich meine, die dem Film zu dem Film passen. Ich wollte so ein bisschen weg vom Spanischen, bin aber doch wieder zurückgekommen, ne? oder? Ja, ich glaube schon. Ja, wie, wie, was hast du dir, hast du dir was vorgenommen? Weil ich hatte vorher gehört, bei, äh, als du dich eingespielt hast, du wolltest irgendwas mit den Kastanietten machen. Ja. Das hast du dann zum Beispiel jetzt weggelassen, also, oder? Ne, das hat nicht so richtig geklappt. Ich habe so einen so Holzblock dabei und ich wollte irgendwie an den Sound der Kastanietten ran und das abstrahieren und das habe ich so ein bisschen gemacht. Ich habe das so einen Holzblock ins Klavier gelegt auf die Seiten und das klang dann vielleicht eher wie, eine, wie ein Cembalo oder so, ich weiß es nicht. <lacht> 
Aber das ist ja auch was Spannendes, wenn man das live begleitet, dass man jetzt nicht unbedingt eins zu eins die Geräusche, die man sieht, auch zu hören bekommt. Also dass man das irgendwie verfremdet, abändert, das ist eine Strategie auch durchaus von dir. Ne? Ja, abso absolut. Also ich versuche so ähm, Klischees zu vermeiden eigentlich. Ich versuche die Klischees zu abstrahieren und damit was eine neue Stimmung zu machen. Und äh, letzten Endes ist die Musik, die ich spiele, improvisiert und ähm, also die folgt ziemlich dem Moment. Ja. ja, weil wir haben hier ja jetzt auch Dramatik und Komödie und nochmal die große Tragödie dann auch am Schluss alles kombiniert. Also ich finde das ganz, ganz spannend, wie man so in so einen Flow auch irgendwie gerät. Kann es sein, dass das bei dir auch manchmal so dich selber da weiter reinzieht, das vielleicht noch als Abschluss? Ähm, ja, ja, also wenn der Film gut ist... Ich sag mal, es gibt bessere als heute Abend. Wenn der Film gut ist, ja, ist so, es geht mir so. Wenn der Film gut ist, äh, ähm, komme ich da in, in einen richtig guten Flow rein und es ist, so ist so ein Loslassen. Es ist so ein Loslassen und der Film ist mein, mein Partner, mein musikalischer Partner, obwohl der natürlich gar nicht reagiert, aber es ist meine Inspiration in dem Moment, wenn ich improvisiere. Und je besser der Film, desto besser. Heute warst du auf jeden Fall großartig. Wir sagen schon mal herzlichen Dank, Uwe Oberg, für den tollen Abend. Dankeschön. Und begrüßen Sie bitte Eva Majeska und Marc Siegel vorne zum Gespräch. Danke. Um, okay, ja, uh, yeah, so ich fange schon mal an auf Englisch. Um, Eva, so we just heard from Uwe that he didn't think this was a good film. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm interested though in pursuing that in relation to some of of your thoughts. Um, um, in particular, um, maybe if we can start with the question of elegance. Um, uh, typically, I mean, elegance um, with Lubitsch would be linked to a certain style, to um, also what we've seen in his silent films, perhaps to a certain um, blocking of the performers within the frame, mm -hmm. the ornamentation on their costumes reflected in the decor, mm -hmm. the use of masks. But here we don't um, we don't get that. It seems it does seem, as you said, somewhat more linked to documentary yes. um, practices. But but seeing it, do you, do you think that that makes it not good? Um, I mean, it's sort of difficult to assess films from you know old films from the right perspective because the question is what is right what is the right perspective? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I think. We should really locate these films in at the time where they're made. You know, we cannot really judge them by current standards because the standards, you know, have changed. So as I said, when I looked at the film, I see the similarity with films made at the time. So it's certainly, it doesn't stand out. Mm -hmm. So you know, if if you if you want to. Um, If you want my answer, was it a masterpiece? I wouldn't say it was a masterpiece mm -hmm. because it didn't feel like that different from other films. Uh, uh, nevertheless, I, I wouldn't say it was a bad film. Uh -huh. You know, this this was this was a sort of you know good story. Uh, you could follow it and appreciate the, the, the acting, particularly of you know of, of Paula Negri. Um, in terms of of um, you know Lubitsch still, I, I think that perhaps Lubitsch still wasn't developed at, at this point, you know, mm -hmm. so well. So you can say there were these you know problems with um, yes, with maybe paying too much attention to you know to the crowds to all this um, spectacle it could be less and and then perhaps the film would be better but again it's not easy to judge <laughs> Just okay. Uh, talking about this question, uh, Uwe mm -hmm. just wanted to, to say something because uh, obviously in this movie uh, some parts were missing, or at least yeah. the pieces of it. Um, can you tell us, because you have seen another version before? Yeah, um, there, there, there has been the part when, when his um, girlfriend came to Sevilla mm -hmm. to meet him. Uh, there was a scene in the bar when she's waiting for him and she's actually she's coming before then. And I, I mm -hmm. think it was, uh, I was really astonished. I did not, did not know what to do because uh, 
there are really parts missing. Also, when she meets uh, the torero. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. Yes, yes, this is the slightly shorter version then. And, he, mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, José became actually a thief. And this is not uh, this shown. Is this mm -hmm. has uh, lacked. Uh, this has been this has missed in the film. So, mm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for that, because that's what we, of course, don't know when we are t uh, looking for the best print. Um, we have to, uh, um, yeah, to trust uh, what what is told to us. And uh, I think the I, what I was really surprised now because the, it's 70 minutes long, mm -hmm. and it was nearly 70 minutes right now. But I had the feeling also that that some parts must have been missing because, because I, I saw another version. I had a, had a DVD at home, and I saw another version which has been broadcasted at uh, uh, television mm -hmm. from the 90s, something like that. Yeah, okay. yeah thanks for that. So <laughs> maybe <c> <laughs> you can... Uh yes, I think it's it's the version which I watched for this was, I think, 10 or more minutes longer. So yes. The, the and so, it, I mean, the effect of this, the effect of this version seems, it, it seemed... Um, like because I also wondered. I thought, oh, it's interesting. I thought it was oh, an interesting choice of Lubitsch that the that the girlfriend doesn't come back, so we yes, don't end up yes. having this kind of um, emotional, um, more emotional. Like it, it's that would have been far more dramatic, far more melodramatic. Yes. Um, for her to see him in this new state, for her to see him, um, but instead it's just it's just like the hits, mm -hmm. the greatest hits of the story in a sense. I mean, without the the emotional part, just a kind of. And also, this somehow makes these parts which are there feel a bit more repetitive, like you know when hmm. we see these sort of crowds going through Seville. Um, Although, I, oh, yeah. sorry, just maybe just yeah. just to shift to, to try to get us away from just trashing the film yeah, no, for no, a second. I don't want to trash <laughs> no, it, uh. no, just just to shift for a second because some of the things that I found quite striking that I hadn't um, expected um, because of my my interest. Um, that's been developed through the series in, in Lubitsch's stylization were these um, sort of documentary shots and, and indeed the, this incredible realism, um, the shots, um, that, that quite incredible shot um, out um, on, the, on the water. You know, I guess in the, in the, um, where, when the, the, the gypsies come back mm -hmm. and there's the time, this kind of real time sequence where we're waiting for the water, um, the, the, the waves to go down so that the other um, gypsies can pass, mm -hmm. that, that seemed like a kind of um, a moment of documentary realism. There was a drama, it was the drama of nature, it wasn't the drama of, of, um, of uh, elegance, let's say, in, yes. in, in, if we link elegance with a more um, artificial style of Lubitsch. Yes, I would say that certainly there is this play, he knows how to play nature, mm -hmm. and I think that perhaps this is also the sort of sign that he's actually urban director, not, not <laughs> the sort of, you know, uh, uh, natural director, because he's somehow aware of the, of the meaning of the mountains and the water. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. as you notice, there is this sort of, there are sequences in the mountains and there are also sequences you know, n near the water, and I think water very often means death, and I think this is what what is suggested there. When we approach the water, there is the tragedy approaching. So I will, mm -hmm, I will mm -hmm. read it this way. But I think this this is this. Is, I mean, he's very effective director in the sense that he's somehow able to you know to to convey meaning by you know playing on on these associations. So, mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. uh, but but for, for, for me, I somehow read it differently. You, you, you mentioned that for you, this has a documentary feel. For me, it doesn't really have this documentary feel. It, 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 it more shows his sort of ability to, you know, to, to play these, to play on these symbols or on, on these sort of associations which are already embedded in culture. So I, I look at, look at mm -hmm. this way, but maybe, you know, the, the, every viewer has, has his or her own interpretation of these scenes. For me, the most kind of the most documentary scenes are really the scenes with the crowds. Yeah, As I said, yeah. uh, the, there are these films, uh, I mean, the, the, the maybe the most interesting from this perspective is the, is the scene when the people are leaving the, leaving the, the factory. 
because it's exactly it's, it's uh, it has almost exactly the same look as this Mitchell and Canyon factory films or gate films. Mm -hmm, These are the mm -hmm, documentary mm -hmm. films showing people, you know, leaving the factories in 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 Lancashire, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and this looks almost exactly like that. So when I watched it, I was kind of surprised that you know you have here this fiction film which actually also shows these people leaving factory and also they look straight you know into into uh, mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. camera so this mm -hmm. was for me the most sort of documentary moment yeah i would just film. before before i go to um verena just add uh, although i i'm sorry come back to the the water, water. scene because i i just think of of Maya Darren's definition of cinematography as mm -hmm. the um, the creative use of accident, mm -hmm. um, and there that that maybe linked to the people looking into the camera is the unexpected movement of the waves that that Lubitsch couldn't know when those actors would feel comfortable going across when they would decide there seemed to be a moment of mm -hmm. of of chance of risk of of um of danger in that sense that made that for me um, okay. um also mm -hmm. an unexpected kind of um giving over of control to to something in front of to the pro filmic if you will mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah interesting I, I didn't think about it oh, i just thought about it right now um okay <laughs> verena yeah i wanted to say um i'm sorry. Um, and yet I found it astonishing. There was not just a staging of crowds in front of the camera. Camera put the camera at some mm -hmm, mm -hmm. staging the, uh, um, uh, the extras or whoever. Um, there's once at least one scene in a tavern. I think it's the first time that the bullfighter comes into play, where the camera moves back through the room, and this is amazing. I, uh, and it's uh, so it's a really um, kind of opening up the room by moving back, and uh, this is certainly well. You can say it's elegant. <laughs> you can say it's a, it's more like a crowd stage. It's really a working with the camera there, and I think it's very unusual for that time, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. I would say so. Yes, yes. So here somehow we see this sort of development from this yeah, static camera. Most mostly there is static camera, but. There are moments where, yes, where something more happens, and this, yes, you you notice that this moment. Yeah, there was also an early um, an early moment um, when we see when when the title card says something about Don Jose, like everyone in the village loves Don Jose, and then then we get the shot of him in the center, and the camera first quite interestingly pans from um, right to left um, across the crowd before it then takes a static. Position, so there seemed that there was some kind of experimentation with with mm -hmm. camera movement that he was mm -hmm. playing with. Mm -hmm. There are other other techno things we can say, but let's let's open up some more. Yeah, Kevin. Yeah, I I tie that movement of this uh, stunning entrance with the camera movement. There's such a there's such a kinetic force to it, with um, you know the, the gestures of Paolo Negri and even the crowd scenes. They all have the the word that comes to mind to tie all these uh, these things together is virility. Or this kind of libidinal energy that this film has, uh, that I, I find this film having, and uh, it, it, I mean, it, it begs the question of how to tie that in with this idea of elegance, which, you know, I, I would say really develops uh, later on in his career, in Lubitsch's career, because uh, this, what year was this one? Nineteen eighteen. Yeah, I mean, the following year you have Oyster Princess, which is, I mean, that's that's a that has a lot of libidinal energy coursing through it and it's about you know the this kind of uh binary between this kind of uncontrolled lib libidinal energy that the oyster princess you know is constantly ex expressing with this uh air of um propriety and elegance and the, the kind of the, the conflict between the two of them that he finds a lot of but this i think i find that this film is really on the side of Libid lib the libidinal and the yeah and really kind of uh letting that come out more than the and and the elegance really is just very st static and um yeah kind of uh hollow i mean what i thought was actually elegant which i, I don't really know what to say about but i think is maybe just it's worth speaking maybe someone else has something is the um the kind of um, parallel or the contrast that we see at the end with this quite striking shot that that was described in the bull rink um, and then the the bull being 
in a sense, almost in the position of the camera, so the off-screen space, um, quite obviously giving us off-screen space, um, but that's like the, the killing of the animal, and then we have um, the murder of, of Carmen, um, a kind of the other animal, if you will, um, but and stab sort of between her back. I mean, I don't. I think you kill. Where do you have to kill a b bull? Also, I think. How many have killed a bull here? Um, Actually, the the killing is not shown. It is but, also I interesting. But yes. <laughs> Uh, but but so it's a, it, so yes. so I think that, that mm -hmm. somehow do you have something to say about that that would does that seem to fit in with your your thinking uh, about her character as uh, exoticized here as as animal and then I mean this unbelievably beautiful mm -hmm. shot um, that of her death. So, so maybe just first answer or I don't know if it was the question. So in terms of elegance, I think that uh, actually later Lubitsch was more elegant than at this stage. So I would say, you know, when it's Carmen, from this perspective, is not such an elegant film. Mm -hmm. It's a film which somehow deals more with the sort of raw emotions, and it's largely to do that the 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 the, the, uh, the topic is so you know so extreme. Mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, indeed he was an elegant director, but it's not the best film to demonstrate that. Uh, and regarding that, yes, yes, I will. I will agree that this is certainly the, you know, yes, yes. I, I think that that indeed the that Carmen is presented in a such a yes as as such an animal, as somebody who, you know, who who follows emotions. But this is also the reason that actually she remains somehow a sympathetic character till the end. When I watch it, you know, I like I still like her. You know, she mm -hmm. might be a mm -hmm. she might be somebody who works in who acts in immoral way, but she's still kind of made to be, you know, likable, not only attractive physically, but indeed likable. And this is may maybe also something about, about um, uh, uh, Lubitsch's sort of approach to their characters, that he somehow renders them sympathetic no matter what they do. And particularly if, if they are sort of driven by sexual desires, this somehow renders them somehow more sympathetic Mm -hmm, than mm -hmm. if they um, control them. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, there's a comment. Yes, hello. Um, I uh, want to ask you, um, I have uh, an idea if maybe this uh, is interesting. I have, I see the similarities to Jean Renoir and this uh, adaption from Emile Sola and this idea of the drive, uh, of human drive and this uh, um, met metaphor for, uh, of of the the mass the, the mass of the human a lot of humans uh, who have no head just to drive in Renoir is it's a train and here I think it's this uh, this parades <coughs> always it's uh, I have the feeling there maybe it's it's connected in some way just as uh, a lot of people who go there with a drive not with a with a head with a, uh, like an animal uh, instinct mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that then even showing the these kind of long shots of the kind of unruly mm -hmm. um, crowds unruly bodies unpredictable behaviors mm -hmm. could could fit in with with the atmosphere of unpredictable libidinal mm -hmm. energy mm -hmm. out of which emerges a, 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 a Carmen Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, so, 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 so actually, uh, when I watch this film now, it's also something else came to m my mind, you know, uh, Deleuze sort of wrote that, you know, people were missing in cinema, that people disappeared from cinema. And this is the difference between the sort of early cinema when we f have people and then later cinema, which is somehow focused on individual characters. Here, we are already film f which is focused on individual characters characters on Carmen and Don Hauser, but somehow people are still visible. There are there is still this sort of focus on on crowds and their energy. So I would say in it now occurred to me that it's a sort of interesting film because it can be seen uh, not only like a tra transitional film in the in the career of Lubitsch, but maybe in a sense a transitional film in the history of cinema. 
when we on the one hand this we have this 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 early cinema when you have crowds and the later cinema epitomized by hollywood when you know charac individual character in the center and here we have something which tries to do both maybe mm -hmm. because you know lubitsch didn't think consciously by this point what he was doing yes maybe th he was just you know was instinctive at, at this stage. Certainly later when he will move to Hollywood, this film will be very much, you know, ab about individuals. Crowds wouldn't play such a, you know, such a role. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think you have to uh, talk about the time because when in 1918 you see the masses and he insinates them for the first time, it's the end of the First World War and everybody is so sad of uh, these masses. Everybody want, doesn't want to see them anymore. And I think that's also a kind of comment when he insinates them in the way he does. So But Then it's like lending a kind of... Um power potential it's it's a kind of redemption of the unruliness of the masses at a time if we follow that at a time when when there's um lack of interest or, or fear of of the masses if 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 that's correct that 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 seems like he's working against that i mean i'm only now thinking about it maybe also because watching this film on a large screen somehow gives the dif different feeling i must say the masses are much more visible somehow much more powerful you know, when you watch it, watch, see them on a large screen than when you watch it on, you know, on, on one's computer. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's, it's a bigger yeah. screen. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering what, um, what you, uh, what happens to Pola Negri in the collaboration with Lubitsch. So in a way, um, in, in this film, it, this film is pretty much a, st a star vehicle. So she's introduced as uh, the kind of the new face and the new dramatic character. And it's a f it's a first collaboration, collaboration, right? No, no, no. Uh, the uh, the mummy was the first uh, film at the, when they played together and they played. I mean, that. Ah, uh, yeah. When when was that? So it was uh, same same year, right? Same year, but I think it was uh, earlier film. So mm -hmm. this wasn't the first collaboration, and they played also act as actors uh, earlier on. So But I was wondering, as as they made a, uh, made quite a few films together. So and and Pula Negri came also to Berlin to to work together with Lubitsch. So, and uh, I still I'm still thinking about what you said about why are the, all these actresses so likable? So why mm -hmm. is Ossi Osvalda so likable? Why is Pula Negri so likable? And it has something to do with the excess within this character and also a whole lot of improvisation that's allowed to this. But if you compare this to um, to uh, Pula Negri in the Mountain Cat, would you say, would you think it's this? Um, is she um, does he conf uh, confine her to a certain type? Is this a kind of quote unquote gypsy character, or isn't isn't there something quite different at play? Um, uh, so the way how he um, how he uh, um, makes makes them play in this. So is there a development also there where uh, within the character of um, of the roles that uh, Negri plays? Does she play in a different way later or? What's your take on that? Um, well, I will have to sort of watch this film, study them sort of more to have a more, you know, deeper thought of that. I would say that I think naturally there was a certain, you know, excess in her. And, you know, in, in this sense, I would say she was quite different from... Uh, Hollywood actresses, maybe you know, Mae West in this sense was comparable to her. I I, th I think there was there was the sort of excess of uh, I would say sexuality and energy in her, and um, yes, but true. But I think that that and I would say this wasn't this wasn't in my opinion something which was um, imposed on her by directors. I would say she was you know naturally like that. That this this excess was in her, and um, but does she already know uh, what the camera does with her? Because she she seems so professional when she's yeah, uh, acting I mean, here. Again, you know the the um, those who wrote about her, for example, mentioned that um, she was very um, um, independent in terms how she presented herself. For example, she made her own makeup. Uh, which sort of suggests that she was quite, you know, in charge of her, you know, persona. 
um, she um, she didn't do her own dresses, but apparently she was very you know particular about you know how she was dressed. So I would say a lot of things were, you know, she, she wasn't this this manufactured star, which we can say she was kind of more natural star who, um, you know projected herself in a, in, a, in a specific way. Maybe this was also the reason that, as I mentioned earlier, she didn't make such a career, big career later on, because, you know, the, 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 um, the, talkie, the talkies were somehow more subdued. Uh, so she was n not able to somehow, you know, reconcile this position of this, you know, sexual over, or, of an energetic and of a sexual and, and exotic star with the new reality which demanded actresses to be somehow, you know, more subdued. I think they probably, but I said I will have to watch these films really, you know, in a succession to somehow be able to compare. I would say probably she, she kept changing. She was more subtle later on, but m maybe this sort of persona didn't change in, in, in the right, you know, speed in comparison with how cinema changed and how these sort of new stars behaved. Because if you if we compare her, for example, with, uh, with uh, uh, Greta Garbo, you know, Garbo was much more, you know, controlled. All these sort of emotions of Garbo was very much, you know, inside. She was almost like a, you know, like, like Marilyn Brando <laughs> later on, mm -hmm. you know, everything was inside rather than playing with her body, you know. Paula Negri was very much about, you know, all her body. We, we can see it very well here, you know, and she not only dances, but whatever she does, she always somehow, you know, makes these various gestures. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I wanted to ask, uh, is it, I mean, this film, I mean, I understand that Carmen could be described as a male melodrama, but this film, actually, I had a little bit difficulty to see that because of Pola Negri, because um, she is, well, yeah, I mean, actually, I can't sympathize with uh, Don Jose. <laughs> 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 it's really difficult. But I mean, I think it has to do a little bit also with that she's not just this um, femme fatale, but she's jumping on the lap of the old mm -hmm. guy and is playing with him. It's it's comedy as well when she is and uh, when when she is kind of uh, taking advantage of the people and uh, so um, yeah I don't know I think yeah well at least I didn't really feel with the suffering Don Jose. Yes, I mean, when I talk that it's a male melodrama, it's sort of, you know, in terms of narrative, it's a male melodrama, yeah? It's sort of, you know, when we read the book and when we read the synopsis, this is the, this is the story of a, you know, male melodrama. But indeed, the, 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 how, how it sort of developed on screen was that it became very much her film. And I think probably also the, the minutes which we are lost here were the minutes which belonged more to law, you know, to, to Don Jose. This is also another aspect. So you are right that it's sort of presented as, you know, her film. That said, you know, in terms of psychological, you know, subtleties, we don't have that much insight into the mind of any of them. Yeah, so this is very much like a film of action rather than film of, you know, emotion so to speak I uh, so so in 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 this sense i don't think you know neither she nor him you know pre present their emotions so much you know so all that all their situations all their problems but i think this is again partly the the, the question it's it's a silent cinema you know the is these sort of subtleties cannot be played so well when you don't have when you don't have, um, you know, dialogue. I asked myself uh, whether the Don Jose is too German in this movie, <laughs> and it doesn't work because of that. I d well, I don't know. <laughs> it's difficult to, <laughs> difficult. I think, I think certainly he is kind of w a bit wooden. Uh, maybe it's not that he's German. Maybe, you know, if there was another actor, he would be, this film will be better, I don't know, or better in the sense of being a sort of this male melodrama. Uh, 
because because uh, if I can mm -hmm. say that um, what I wondered or I was surprised of uh, that there were all the signs that were in the back that they are uh, they were written in Spanish even and in at a time where the nationalist uh, feeling was I think very strong because you d didn't want to have to do something with the other countries in Europe and uh, then you uh, have a Spanish army and you give it to uh, make them look like Uh, kind of the German army in a way maybe and Harry Liedtke as the German star uh -huh. uh, and Pola Negri is the oriental st uh, style uh, type uh, so, so she's very very in contradiction to to Harry Liedtke and I was wondering what Lubitsch wanted to do with that because he could have uh, yeah chosen an, uh, a guy who is uh, similar to her mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. himself I, 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 himself <laughs> yes But it's somehow, you know, the, the whole story is in a, s a, a the, the story is sort of s uh, uh, set in Spain, and you know, we can say concerns Spanish people, but it's still it's a story of this sort of man who is kind of located in the center and being corrupted by somebody coming from the periphery. This is this is a actually very uh, common narrative. Which we find in uh, in films made around around I mean ma made uh, after the Second World War and also this is a trope which we find in literature I mean in Poland I think probably there will be three or four you know interwar melodramas based on this scheme that you know there is some sort of man who is you know from bourgeois background and he is somehow seduced by a woman who comes from for example from seven from the countryside and it all somehow finishes badly so despite the fact they are of both you know uh, Spanish this is also cl class is always there You know, she is. We don't see it so 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 well, but you know, obviously, he is from, you know, from a better background than than her. So he is sort of corrupted by somebody who comes from province who's poor. Yeah. Um, although, although it seemed like I mean, she she's in the city. You know, he at least the way is I sort of maybe sleepingly understood it that he. He's, you know, at the beginning we see him somewhat in the country with, with his girlfriend and family, and then he gets the call to go to Sevilla, which is, yes, I think he's from the Basque country, yes, so he's, he's going down south. Yes, but, but he's that's from, still from a more kind of, you know, established background. He's mm. some, somehow, you know, and she's a gypsy, so no matter whether mm -hmm, she lives mm -hmm. in, you know, in Seville or elsewhere, you mm -hmm. know, gypsies were mm -hmm. are always mar marginalized. So right, I think right. this, this is. This is like a you know proper Spanish person shouldn't really have a relationship with a gypsy woman. It's mm -hmm, all, it's mm -hmm. always somehow condemned by mm -hmm. you know by society, mm -hmm. and so so it's not in, in the case of you know geography. It's it's again more the case of you know of class really. Mm -hmm. If you are gypsy, you are of you know of uh, you are from underclass. Mm -hmm. you, if you are you know non gypsy Spanish, you are by definition of a higher class. So. So the film yeah. is somehow about the impossibility of, you know, of uh, um, broaching this division. Mm -hmm. may, may I um, just raise a uh, actually a slightly different mm -hmm. subject? I just wanted to come back to um, Jewishness because some of um, um, in your presentation um, there seemed to be you were invoking ways in which Lubitsch is understood as Jewish, but those ways are contradictory. Um, that I mean, sort of contradictory the way anti-Semitic beliefs are contradictory in themselves, that Jews would be both um, um, sort of uh, like uh, uh, um, from the milieu, um, this kind of um, cheap, um, um, unsophisticated comedy, this like slapstick, unsophisticated comedy um, that the that, as you mentioned, that maybe the Nazis, liked but also elegant cosmopolitan um like in a sort of untenable um untenable beliefs that go together could could you elaborate on that is that is that would you see that as i mean what we've seen now in in this series is we saw you know um the last semester so these um jewish milieu comedies these fantastic films that lubitsch made um where he's 
um, working, I think, much in the way you, you described, he works with stereotypes and keeping them in circulation and rethinking them, Jewish stereotypes. Um, and then we see him move to Hollywood and maybe develop the style that people call elegant. Um, so I wonder if we need to, hist if we need to separate those things, um, like uh, historically, to say maybe first milieu comedy and then there was a change. Do, do you understand some of the things yeah, I'm yeah, trying yeah, to open yeah. up? I just want to open up this, mm -hmm. um, this what to me seems like an anti-Semitic stereotype to mm -hmm. say Lubitsch was cosmopolitan, elegant, and also um, guttural and crude and... I mean, I don't find it sort of like anti-Semitic stereotypes to, to say, obviously, you know, by stereotyping, we kind of reduce Jewishness. Mm -hmm. of something why obviously there are different Jews yes mm -hmm. there are different Jews in different countries and individuals are Jews are somehow also different so this may be it's already wrong to somehow talk about Jewishness in sort of singular but I would say that at least in terms if you look at the careers of uh, successful Jewish directors there will be certain common traits and I think that uh, th this 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 common thing was that they are able to somehow you know uh, enter different cultural milieus and somehow respond to different cultural expectations. I mean, mm -hmm. certainly it's true that, you know, Jewish directors, like, like you know, we have a way, for example, of, of uh, Hungarian directors who moved to Hollywood and they were not all Jewish and somehow, but the Jewish actually proved much more successful. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, if you look at, at uh, this might be a pure accident, but for example, after 68, there was again, you know, several Czech directors who moved to Hollywood, to America to make career, but only one of them, Milos Forman, who was Jewish, managed to succeed. So, so you know, it's in our blood. This may be no. I'm saying this might be an accident, but I me mean, for me, maybe it sort of suggests that you know these sort of Jewish directors were kind of like you know more kind of cosmopolitan from from the beginning, and uh, you know, again, some of these Jews. And this, uh, I mean, certainly Lubitsch's family was was presented in this uh, biography as being somehow, you know, non-religious, really not bothered about their ethnicity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, f father was from Grodno and Jewish, but actually he didn't mind about anything about either being Jew or being a Russian. You know, he mm -hmm, was just mm -hmm. somehow, you know, happy to have his business and have a good life. And so, so in this sense, so as I would say, the fact that uh, uh, Lubitsch in his early career make, made films which were re later regarded anti-Semitic is... Uh, uh, but regarded uh, by whom as anti-Semitic? Yes, by, by Nazis. I think when he was making them, I think he didn't really think that they were anti-Semitic. He was mm -hmm. just somehow, you know, responding to a specific cultural, you know, need and make these films which somehow fit with this cultural need. And the same later, you know, when he moved to Hollywood, he didn't need to make these films. He had to stereotype different peoples because they were different, again, cultural requirements. And this film also shows that mm -hmm. he had no problems, you know. This film can be somehow, again, uh, labeled as being anti-gypsy because it sort of presents Carmen as this sort of ultimate gypsy. But I would say at the time when he made it, you know, people wouldn't, react in such a way nowadays if he was somebody will make this, the film about gypsies mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. that let's say in hungary or in, Ru in romania or in slovakia where there is a lot of you know effort to somehow destigmatize gypsies this film probably will be regarded as racist mm -hmm. but well, this but is a reason to somehow that we need to kind of you know f locate films in a specific cultural context and look look at them through this context rather mm -hmm. than somehow in absolute terms. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I'm uh, uncomfortable with the idea of thinking that the cosmopolitanism is somehow there as a kind of core Jewish quality that then gets, is like a potential or something. I wonder if there's other questions of aspiration, of assimilation into society of different other social factors that play a role. I mean, even looking at Woody Allen's career and looking at, um, uh, I was shocked when I first, I, I think when I first started seeing Woody, some of Woody Allen's films where basically he had um, um, non-Jewish people sp 
doing the same Jewish jokes he had always done, in a sense where you see the kind of um, the the very strong Jewish milieu that was um, so much a part of Woody Allen's early work gets replaced and gets performed by, you know, in Match Point or something. Or I, I mean, that's maybe not the best example, but but to um, I wonder if we could instead think differently and then question even Lubitsch's elegance rather than than his early part. Could we maybe call that into question and think about the Jewishness of his elegance? That's not simply a kind of renunciation of of his um, milieu comedies, but is is the milieu comedies somehow um, um, translated or something? I don't know. I'm, I'm, but but in general, I think the idea of the cosmopolitanism. I think that that, that that's a problematic um, notion. But I I don't know why you regard sort of cosmopolitanism as somehow. Um I don't know, negative? You look at it in a negative way? I mean, it, it used to be looked in a negative way, for example, by Nazis. Mm -hmm, yeah? mm -hmm. This was the one reason that, you know, Nazism was so un anti-Semitic because they sort of accused Jews of somehow being anti-German because mm -hmm. they didn't have this sort of identification with Germany. Yeah? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in this sense, but, you know, normally I would say, uh, I, f I mean, from my perspective, it's somehow like a like a neutral description. I would say, you know, you can be cosmopolitan, mm -hmm. you can be, you know, nationalist. Mm -hmm. It's it's sort of, you know, by itself, it's neither mm -hmm. good nor bad. So mm -hmm. I don't see it either as a praise or as a as a sort of uh, criticism. I'm just mm -hmm, saying mm -hmm. that at least you can you can sort of notice that this is a trait of a, of a number of successful Jewish directors. I think in British context, Korda will be the, mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the epitome of that. And, mm -hmm. you know, when, for example, I show my students the uh, uh, private life of Henry VIII, they are really surprised that it was made by a foreigner. The question is how a foreigner can make such a film which is sort of like the, like the ultimate British film. Mm -hmm. But I would say maybe this is exactly because he was a foreigner and, you mm -hmm, know, he mm -hmm. somehow already understood these sort of stereotypes and was able to use them better than somebody who has a specific strong, you know, national or regional mm -hmm, identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, no, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe it's also helpful to take a, a further look to how he uh, insinates himself because he has the, this short appearance at the beginning. And um, yeah, maybe you can comment on that when he's sitting on the desk and uh, reading in a book and mm -hmm. he's he's trying to yeah, to to to, to have a very yeah. I I don't find the adjective. What do you say? <laughs> I don't I don't really have that much to say apart from you know, he he was like doing Hitchcock before Hitchcock or something, mm -hmm. something like that. So, um, he's, he's, a, he's a young man. He sorry, he's a young man. He, he wasn't at war. What was kind of a problem maybe at that time. And he tries to be the very serious, strong director. And he's, uh, he, yeah. And in a way he has a Jewishness in, in this appearance also. Um, I, maybe you can comment on that. I don't know. Because the, Jews the, are, love books and desks no but uh, the, the <laughs> no uh, no I, I mean i think about that the 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 installation of the, of the scene and when the set, set decoration and like that mm -hmm. it was very yeah not elegant but it's a very yeah wealthy house in a way i, I, I wondered if it was because i'm not familiar with that i don't know if people are familiar with that in silent film where where then the director shows himself as well that seemed to me quite interesting for me at least n not knowing much about it it seemed quite innovative um and in that sense i wondered if it was linked to the the announcement in the title cards that this is um this is a new lubitsch film this is a new kind of lubitsch film it's a loose it's not he, lubitsch you know from loose spiels this is not this the the funny lubitsch maybe it's not the funny milieu comedy lubitsch but you you come to see lubitsch films in part because you want to see him and in 1918, yeah, he was. I mean, the the Meyer aus Berlin, the the Jewish films were were already earlier, 1914, 1916, right? I think. Um, but um, and so so I think that at that, I mean, he was a known actor, and so people would want to go and see him, and this was a way of him staging himself 
in a way that would be appropriate to a dramatic film to give a different kind of Lubitsch, not like what we saw in um, in Shu Palas Pincus, um, for instance. That, that was sort of how I took it. Um, but Verena, do you have? Yeah, I wanted to come back to the um, whether the Jewishness is a special quality that um, uh, qual or qualifies to become a good um, 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 filmmaker uh, in the mm -hmm. U.S. And I would question that because I mean they are all migrants moving over there from uh, from Europe, and you find certain well a lot of. Um, examples where it's different. Max Ophels had so much trouble to get into um, into business there. Five, six years or so he was without work. Um, someone like uh, Detlef Sirk or Douglas Sirk um, made such a big career and is not Jewish. I mean, I think <laughs> this is, I, I, I mean, and I mean, it's it, it, all of them needed to move at least from one. I mean, for Sirk, it's also true, and I think it's also true for Ophuls, who moved from uh, between different cultures. Um, well, obviously, yes, you are right that you will find many non Jewish directors who made career in Hollywood. But at the same time, I would say that given that, you know, Jews everywhere in Europe uh, actually a very tiny min minority. It's somehow remarkable that so many Jewish directors were successful in Europe. And if you look like, like for example, Eastern Europe, you know, the only really internationally successful Polish director was Polanski, who was Jewish. The only internationally successful Czech, di Czech director is, Folma, is Milos Forman, who was also Jewish. So if you if we sort of look at these, you know, these examples, there is certainly a large proportion of them. Yeah, I think Germany is obviously a different country because it was so much larger. So many more of them, you know, emigrated. But, um, uh, but I mean, the point is that that you somehow, when you emigrate, you somehow have to uh, adopt yourself to a different culture. And maybe you know, if you are not so rooted in this original culture, it's easy for you. And maybe this was this is not like an inherent trait of Jews, but you know, if this family was already kind of cosmopolitan because father was actually you know Russian rather than German, <laughs> this 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 maybe made this transition easier because young Lubitsch was already exposed to different cultures, as similarly as Polanski was exposed to different culture from his you know young life so it's not jewish jewishness per se but it's more like you know being multicultural already in the early life if you are so multicultural in your own country it's uh, somehow i would say easier to move to a different culture culture because it's not such a you know cultural shock this is how i would mm -hmm. and i wonder also about different uh, but if we would need to make distinctions among um jews at the time and i know that um that was something vincent heidegger was always pushing was the um, Lotte Eisner, was it, um, remember, you can correct me, Lotte Eisner hated Lubitsch. Krakauer, I think, was very negative about Lubitsch. And that this kind of distinction between the Eastern European Jews and the Western European Jews, kind of class dis distinctions among the Jews. And so I don't entirely know which, um, I don't know enough about the, the, develop the kind of connections that they would have had in Hollywood, but I wonder if there's also geographical and class distinctions that are playing a role in, in the degrees of success among, among the Jewish directors, so that it's not, it's not simply uh, um, because we're so great, even though we are. Well, I, I don't know that, I don't know. <laughs> and I don't know whether they sort of forged specific links in Hollywood because they were Jews. Mm -hmm. I somehow doubt it because again, you know, Hollywood was much more about, you know, just finding the right people to make the right films. Uh, and maybe on this, you know, in, in these situations, actually maybe national identity matters mattered more than whether one was, you know, Jewish or non-Jewish. Mm -hmm. Say probably what happened was that sort of you know Hungarians tried to help each other and mm -hmm, Poles mm -hmm. tried to help each other rather than Jews from these different 
countries, you know, st sticking together. Obviously, we also talk here about the specific category of Jews, those who are, you know, urban mm -hmm. and, you know, quite well educated and so on. There were obviously also Jews who lived in the province mm -hmm. or, you know, Jews who were religious. So, you know, when we talk here about Jewishness, we also only talk about, you know, proportion mm -hmm, of, mm -hmm. of these people and their culture. That's true. Can, um, Maybe so we don't just finish um, on the Jews, <laughs> although my grandmother would be very happy. Um, maybe instead to go back to um, just one comment I wanted to make also that just to complicate our image of the, the German guy, the boring German Don Jose, that I, I was sort of shocked by his, um, by his appearance because I was prepared for him to be boring from, from some of what you had said in your talk. And then when we see him at the beginning, um, he kind of manhandles his girlfriend at the beginning, I thought. Doesn't he? Like he sits, um, he's sitting there the first shot. We sit there, he's kind of shy. And then he kind of leaps up and, and grabs her. And for me, there was a kind of almost like a parallel in the way we see Pola Negri, that then in a sense he gets topped by Pola Negri, that, that there's, so I don't think that he, somehow that char his character for me was somewhat impulsive, um, um, more dom dominating of of the woman um, in his girlfriend, and then what we see during the film is that he gets pacified. So one could even see that as a kind of, if you will, feminist critique of of um, of his behavior. Yes, yes, I agree with you that he starts promising and then somehow gets <laughs> <laughs> emasculated. Yes, yes, because they. Say so, yes. <laughs> One thing which I wanted to pay attention, I don't know, and I don't really actually maybe need your um, feedback, is I, what, what I find in interesting in this film is how it also use subtitles, namely that mm -hmm. it doesn't use, use, doesn't use subtitles a lot. Most of what we see uh, are letters. I also found it quite, you know, clever on Lubitsch's part that rather than sort of, you know, having a proper sort of intertitles uh, 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 so much you know n information is is included in these um letters and i mm -hmm. wonder if if we the other examples of films which which y use letters so much i think i never saw so many you know silent films with with letters yeah I think that was a very nice point for, uh, at the end of this evening. Uh, it was not only promising at, at the beginning, it was promising all all <laughs> night. So have a big applause for Eva Majeska. Thank, Thank you very you. much. And Mark Ziegler, of course. For inviting me again. And Staying Und for so long, thank yes. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, in zwei Wochen können Sie den nächsten weiblichen Star an Lubitschs Seite sehen. Dann wird Marlene Dietrich hier erscheinen. Angel, den Sie in den USA gedreht haben, kann ich Ihnen sehr ans Herz legen. Die Kopie kommt dann auch wirklich von da, wo ich es sage, nämlich vom BFI. Ähm, das war die Stiftung Deutsche Kinematik und ich bin ganz froh drum, dass die Kopie nicht von uns war. Aber ich wünsche Ihnen einen guten Nachhauseweg und bis hoffentlich in zwei Wochen wieder. Tschüss. Dankeschön. <lacht>